Hello? Hello? Ah, uh, it's working! Finally! Where are we? Earth? What? I could have sworn we were streaming to Tropic, but I guess I won't waste the resources. <clears throat> Greetings, Living Space Dust Collections. I am Ikari, the benevolent and wondrous future dictator of Planet Tropic, and perhaps Earth eventually. My primary objective is simple. To research all that I can about my targets so that I will have an easier time destroying them and conquering my home world. You see, as a scientist, I need to collect data on a regular basis and have stumbled upon something quite interesting as of new. Fan fiction. I have no idea what's to come of this new plunder into the depths of mine enemies' minds. But my allowed readings will consist of three chapters at a time so that the data I collect is full and thorough. Too long and don't care version? I'm doing a dramatic reading because science. Today's piece will be Broken Genesis by Firania. It seems to be based in an alternate setting with alternate representations of my mortal rivals, enemies, and comrades. It is also a true battle of good versus evil. Exciting. Let us begin. What would happen in a world without a Geniforce? Would any of us be the same? I believe such a place would be more raw more spontaneous in the world we live in today. But someone would have to take charge, right? Make sure stuff doesn't go wrong. Kronos probably would know if such a timeline were to exist. I should remember to ask him when next I see him. Hopefully, curiosity won't kill this cat. From the Journal of Xanthos Ilero. Is that how you pronounce his name? The night breeze held a strange aura, foreboding yet peaceful. A rustle in the leaves could be heard from the south, Several woodland animals scurrying away from the sound with pure fear. You could feel it. A powerful, archaic aura that could not be tamed, slowly approaching. This aura was merely a harbinger to a being of raw power, dressed in all black. His fairy face could not be seen from under his hood. The grass browned and died under his feet, not even scratching the surface of his true power. He stopped walking staring upwards, directly at the building in front of him. A normal building to the average person, but to him, he knew what was beneath its plain exterior. He took a step back, looking over his shoulder. The branches of the leaves shuddered as several more beings appeared from the foliage. The first was a female, humanoid hedgehog with a fur as black as the night sky. Hot pink stripes dabbed her quills and glowed eerily in the moonlight. She wore a purple dress that stopped halfway down her calves. She wore pink shoes trimmed with black and black gloves with golden rings as cuffs. Her pink eyes held a malevolent fire as she gazed upon the building, fist clenched in cold anger. A necromantress. Her name is Charisma. She failed to notice the nearly invisible beam of red light her feet passed through, a silent alarm. The second was also a hedgehog with blood-red fur and a crazed look in his maroon eyes. He only wore black sweats, a sword scabbard slung across his torso. His silver shoes were streamlined, made for quick accelerations at the blink of an eye. The crimson hedgehog chuckled as he flipped his dirty gray headbang. They were close to their prize. He could feel it. In the distance, he could hear dogs barking. Guard dogs, he guessed. He looked over at the hooded figure, waiting for approval. The figure lifted a hand and waved, seemingly uninterested. With this hedgehog, scum, that was good enough. Scum accelerated forward, reaching incredible speeds in a short amount of time. He turned to the corner, surprising both the guard dog and the guard with it. The hedgehog reached his back, ripping out his silver sword and violently slashing the guard dog. The dog yelped weakly as his eyes began to lose focus from the deep wounds. The canine tried to get up, but its body wouldn't respond. Oh, but Scum wouldn't let the dog off that easily. The hedgehog returned the sword to its scabbard and lifted his head, glowing crimson light taking shape in it. It took the form of a red ring, large enough for the hedgehog to fit his whole hand through. And so he did, adjusting the ring on his wrist and pointed a finger at the dog. The ring flared red, and an inferno of flame spiraled out of his finger, engulfing the dog and ending it. Scum began to cackle, pleased with himself. A gunshot cut him off, and he turned to the right to look at the guard, his pistol shaking in his hands. The hedgehog's smile turned into a scowl. 
the ring's flames dying out as the crimson evaporated into nothingness. Scum smiled eerily, jumping forward, but vanishing in thin air, too fast for the eye to follow. In the span of one second, Scum had managed to land several hundred punches on the guard. The hedgehog took a step back as the guard fell to the ground, overcome with pain. Scum grunted as he kicked the guard in the side of the head with his steel-toed silver shoes, knocking out the guard instantly. By now, the others had caught up. The black-hooded figure strode past the crimson hedgehog and stood before the entrance. One of the other beings present was a silver tiger, his fur glowing with a dull radiance as if bottled. Storm, ready to burst at any moment. He wore a black vest and black pants. His shoes were a silvery hue with purple trim. Known as Hyperion, he held up a hand illuminating the entrance for a brief moment, enough for scum to run forward and take out all the guards. Charisma snapped her fingers, and as she did so, several masses of bone and rotted skeletons tore free from the earth, forming at least a dozen skeletal monsters of varying sizes and designs. She glared at them all, mentally commanding that to stay and destroy anyone who tried to enter the facility. She turned on her heels, snootily walking with the others into the facility. Charisma could feel her heart beating faster with adrenaline as she saw several guards passing out and or dead on the floor. Courtesy of scum, perhaps. Hyperion cloaked the party in a dull light as they made their way to the staircase, going down to the lowest level possible. Of course, it wasn't the absolute lowest. No, what these people wanted was much deeper in the basements of the building. Hyperion put out the light as they reached the bottom of the staircase. The only visible exit led outside. But not everything was as it seemed. They finally reached the checkpoint, a place of no return. They glanced at each other. Would anyone back out? The black cloaked being that led the beings motioned the final member of the group, a hedgehog with an air of perfection around it. His name? Floan, the Iceville, as he was called by his victims. The term was short for Icy Evil, a self-crowned title Floan took great pride in. The Iceville coughed, preparing himself as he began to remove the heat from the room. He placed his hand on the wall, freezing it to make it reveal its true form. The cold ice spread over the wall completely, and Floan took a step back to allow someone else to break it. Allow me, Hyperion grunted, throwing a sphere of intense light at the wall, the heat of the light melting the ice from the wall, which crumbled away from being exposed to two temperatures extremes in such a short amount of time. The wall was a vault door, disguised with cloaking technology. Charisma stepped forward, placing an ear on the door as she broke the combination. Sliding, sliding, door, sliding, vault, open, door, open, open, open. Chapter 2 He's back! A green hedgehog with a staff strapped to his back strode into the conference room, holding a stack of photos and slamming them on the table. He furrowed his brows as he stared at the other dozen people present. A male skunk in a priest garb blinked as he looked through the pictures. Known as Alex Law, he knew several other people in the pictures. A team-up between spelled Ragnarok. He, along with the other few members of the council, were the only ones who could understand the enormity of the situation. Who is Genesis? One voice piped up belonging to a red and black wolf girl. She tilted her head to the side as Genesis glanced at her. He's called Vane, Poinsettia, Genesis replied, a few gasps from older members following his statement. Approximately five minutes ago, an alarm building 21-2 showed this. He points to a television screen showing the intruders on video. In it, several figures are seen, black hooded one in front. Genesis' finger moves over to that figure. That's Vane, a monster. He's the god of defense, a male fox with a flaming tail muttered. Super powerful, nigh, indestructible, definitely unkillable. Trust me, I've tried. Thank you for your, uh, encouraging input, Blastion. Genesis replied as Blastion shrugged nonchalantly. We have identified the others, and they're all S-level villains with Vane being X-level, Charisma the Necromantress, Hyperion the Titan of Light, Floan the Iceville, and that Mobian monster, Scum, too. 
I have decided to send in members to defeat these villains and return them to the maximum security prison. We need Geniforce members that know how to beat these guys the best. I'll be picking the team, so don't get your hopes up. Do not tell the civilians. The last thing we need is a riot in New Genifor City. Wait, what's in that building that's so important anyway? Alex said as he scratched his head. Genesis looked down for a moment. An object that a small group of Geniforce members recovered recently. A chronostone. As Genesis spoke, Poinsettia jumped up. I was in that group! I was wondering what happened to that thing. She nodded her to herself, now understanding the situation more clearly. That artifact can grant any wish, even bring back the dead. So who's going out to beat these losers? A cyan hedgehog spoke up. Genesis stared at the girl, Luna, for a moment before replying. Blashin and you, Luna, me, of course, Speedster, and Xanthos. Speaking of which, where are those two anyway? Genesis asked, noticing that the Crimson Hedgehog and Yellow Cat were absent from the meeting. I think they're in the lab, Xanthos mentioned before the crystals of planet Iciora seemed to hold a special property of some sort, Lashin said, waving his hands. Bored, Genesis nodded mentally, noting to talk to the two absentees. You are dismissed, Genesis whipped around, arms crossed, as he walked towards the elevator with long, precise steps. He nodded to the secretary and pushed down the arrow near the elevator, indicating the destination was on a lower level of the building. The elevator door slid open, and Genesis walked in, rubbing his eyes. You know, in a story entitled Broken Genesis, you would think that there would be a little bit more, I don't know, broken Genesis? Unless it's a metaphor for shattered beginnings, I don't see the point. Aside from that... Maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part, though. To continue! He really couldn't believe that Vane had managed to break into the dome known as Building 21 too. The building had the most advanced security systems in the world, or at least, that's what he thought. Genesis sighed, not even sure if Geniforce was ready to take on a collection of such dangerous villains. The elevator doors opened, and Genesis strode out, seeing a flash of high-powered lightning surge past the glass-like walls. He looked to the right, towards an experimental weapons area, seeing the two people he was looking for, jumping up and down excitedly. He tapped on the wall, getting their attention. With a grin, he opened the two glass-like doors and approached the two. One, a cat. The other, a hedgehog. The cat, Xanthos, was holding a strange turquoise crystal that cracked with few sparks every few seconds. This is awesome, the hedgehog. Speedster laughed, pointing the crystal excitedly. Genesis cocked his head to the side, confused. Xanthos took a step forward. It's like a sponge. Originally, I only knew that this crystal could turn matter into energy and transport it into another location. Then it returns the energy into matter. But now I found out that it can amplify energy several times over. You could also probably use it to store large amounts of energy, like a vault of some sort, the cat said as we placed the crystal on the nearby stand. It's really quite interesting what you could find at Iciora. Maybe it's related to the Scepter Guardians? M Genesis cut him off. The magic rocks could wait. Vane isn't back. We're heading to Building 21-2 to beat him to his possible prize, the Chrono Stone. Xanthos nodded, holding the crystal and grabbing both Genesis and Speedster. They were quickly outlined in turquoise energy and blinked out of existence. Genesis groaned as he saw color swirling, spiraling past him in what seemed to be a wormhole. His head began to hurt as he even began to see his life. Every child, every friend. He saw his birth parents' death at the hands of the monster, only known as the demon. At the last thing he saw was Juliet. A golden hedgehog with blonde hair, smiling and extending a hand. He reached forward. But the world faded around him. He slowly opened his eyes to the sounds of the night. He looked up, seeing the entrance to Building 21 2. Did I forget to mention the hallucinogenic properties of the Navidium? Xanthos' voice chuckled from behind. Genesis grunted, and he pulled himself off the ground, dusting himself off. He glanced behind him, seeing Xanthos wake up Speedster after putting the stone in his pocket. Navidium? Genesis asked, seeing an unconscious guard nearby. He quickly checked the guard's pulse. 
Though faint, he could still feel life within this man. To the right of the man was the charred limb of an animal, probably canine. Genesis shook his head, deeming this was the work of scum. He closed the guard's wide eyes, hating the work of the villains who had been involved. That's what I'm calling it. As most of its traits relate to the energy, Xanthos had finally woke Speedster, and the three stood in front of the building. The air was cold and lifeless. Something was coming, and soon. So what are we waiting for? Speedster asked as he scratched the back of his head. Let's just get this thing started. Not until the other two members of the team arrive. A moment after Genesis had spoken, a cyan portal had opened up near them. With Blast and Luna walking out of it, Luna was instantly on edge, sensing a malevolent presence nearby. Stay on guard, guys. Chapter 3 As soon as the words left Luna's lips, Charisma's undead minions sprung from the shadows, mouths dripping with drool. They were instantly upon the heroes, overwhelming them with their numbers. They were misshapen, their bodies contorted into strange positions, and mouths gnashing with drool. The heroes quickly readied themselves for battle. Blastion front flipped towards a nearby group of undead, his lava tail blazing as he tail whipped them. The frail bones instantly snapped under the heat and fell to the ground, the body smashing to bones on impact. Blastion then lifted a hand to the undead's defenseless head and unleashed a wave of lava to consume them. He felt a sudden rush of wind to blow past him, and he watched Speedster battle his own undead. This one was bigger, and wouldn't fall as easily. Speedster unsheathed his blade, striking the undead several times at speeds the eye could not follow. The Crimson Hedgehog then spun the sword in his hand several times before sheathing it once more. A dark blue ring formed around his wrist as he held out his palm towards the giant. Water was ripped out of the trees, snapping them into splinters and slamming onto the undead giant with great force. The water tore away at its joints, leaving the giant unable to stand, let alone move. Speedster grinned, took out his sword once more, spinning it several times before jabbing it into the giant's head. Luna was having problems of her own. The undead she was battling had cryomancy powers, ultimately nullifying her own cryokinesis if she used that power directly. She'd have to use her psychic powers, her wits, and indirectly use her cryokinesis to win this battle. She glared at the undead mage, freezing its feet to the ground. She felt a sudden sensation in her hand. Something was trying to contact her. She took a step back, just as Xanthos dropped from the tree branch and firing lightning onto the conductive ice. The mage let out an unearthly scream as it was blasted apart by power. Luna and Xanthos glanced at each other before quickly high-fiving and battling more undead. Luna noticed several undead giants swarming over Genesis. Okay, and for the parts that they involve talking... I've decided that I'm going to have a voice changer for this. Forgive my lack of accuracy. I'm just trying to get inside my enemy's heads. Guys! Genesis! She yelled as she ran towards the assault, but was stopped short by a look in Genesis' eyes. She saw his mouth move, but was too far away to hear him. A split second later, an emerald blast of light energy erupted from his hands, incinerating the giants with ease. With the undead resting in peace once more, the heroes joined up. Really, Genesis? You used the Jenna cannon? Total overkill, Luna said with a chuckle. Genesis only grinned in reply. He then turned his attention to the building, peering inside the abyss of an entrance. Let's go, he said as he walked into the building. The others close behind. He held a hand up, his fist holding light magic to light the way. Littering the halls were dead bodies, all held faces of fear and shock. Genesis wrinkled his nose, praying for all those souls to find their way to peace. He approached an elevator and pushed the down arrow button near it. The door slowly creaked open and the Geniforce walked in. Genesis pushed several floor buttons in unison and small lever opened out from the secret compartment on the bottom of the control panel. Luna pulled it as Genesis motioned sending the elevator descending floor slowly. So, what's the plan? Speedster asked as he gazed at the secret lever. The others exchanged looks. There was really no plan, 
just securing the Kronos Stone before Vayne and his group got there. With such awe-inspiring power at the wrong hands. We go in, beat the baddies, and go home with Team Crumpets. Glaston muttered, crossing his arms. Essentially, yes. That, that was the plan. We've been in this elevator for a while. Luna pointed out as the first floor arrow had been on the base floor for at least a minute now. Genesis only smiled and wagged a finger. This building is secret floors that only particular ed elevator can go to. It's going to a sub-basement. The very bottom one, actually. He spoke. The elevator doors creaked open to reveal a cavern yawning out before them. The Geniforce cautiously walked out, examining their surroundings. Everyone, be careful, Genesis said as he raised a hand of light magic, lighting up the cavern so the group could see. There was not much there visually, but there were torches on the cavern walls right before the cavern split into two tunnels. Genesis grabbed one, stopping the flow of magic in his hand as he did so. We'll split up here. Speedster, Luna, I want you two on that right tunnel. Xanthos, Blashin, and I will go to the left. Luna, if you get in trouble, send me a message through your armband. Xanthos said to Luna as he began to walk towards the left tunnel with Blashin and Genesis. Luna nodded and began to head towards the right tunnel. Speedster, not far behind. In all honesty, Broken Genesis, as of this point, has a solid introduction. We meet our villains, they display their abilities, and we even figure out what they're after. Our heroes, of course, get more screen time, so we can bet that we'll be seeing more of them and their abilities soon enough. Character descriptions are minimal and simple, and it is nice to see a breakup between the meetings of the good guys. There is some action here, which is good for those who like it, and a sense of plot moving forward. So far, I think this might prove more useful than I thought. I like it. Do you? Comment, share, whatever you want. Until next time, I leave you.